the other time someone asked me to uh, write anything I wanted. <coughs> in 2002, the Tate magazine, the, the magazine that Tate modeled, and asked, asked me to write something. <laughs> and they got this, which is called Shiny Balls of Mud. <laughs> I don't have favorites, like, between my novels. I sort of, I like them all. But this is, this is actually, I think, my favorite piece of, piece of non-fiction. Actually, because it doesn't sound like a piece of non-fiction. By the way, everything in this is as true as I was able to ascertain it to be. Can't make this stuff up. Uh, <laughs> Japan, 1996, a woman's 19-year-old son hasn't been doing well in school. He goes into his room one evening and closes the door. He only leaves his room when he's certain that she and his father are either absent or sleeping. She stands silently before his door for hours, waiting for him to emerge. He uses the kitchen when he's sure of his parents' absence, or the living room, watching television there or using the computer. He uses the bathroom, emptying whatever containers he keeps for this purpose. She continues to slip his weekly allowance under the door and assumes that he buys food and other supplies in all-night convenience stores and from the ubiquitous vending machines. He's 25 years old now. She hasn't seen him for six years. <coughs> when I first visited the Shibuya branch of Takyu Hands, I was looking for a particular kind of Japanese sink stopper perfectly plain black sphere of rubber, slightly larger than a golf ball and quite a bit heavier, on a length of heavy-duty stainless steel ball chain. An architect friend in Vancouver had shown one to me. He admired the design for its simplicity and functionality. It found the drain on its own, seating itself. I was going to Tokyo for the first time, so he drew a map to enable me to find <laughs> Tokyo hands. The story said he couldn't quite describe, except that they had these stoppers. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I misunderstood the name as Tokyo Hands, but once there, I learned that the store was a branch of the Tokyo department store chain. There's a photo archaic decoration spire atop the Shibuya store with a trademark green hand, and I learned to navigate by that, finding my way from Shibuya Station. As the Abercrombie and Fitch of my father's day was to the well-heeled sport fisherman or hunter of game, Takyu Hands is to the amateur carpenter, or to people who take exceptionally good care of their shoes, <laughs> or to those who construct working brass models of Victorian steam tractors. <laughs> Takyu Hands assumes that the customer is very serious about something. <laughs> and that happens to be shining a pair of shoes and the customer is sufficiently serious about it, he or she may need the very best German sole edge enamel available for the museum grade weekly restoration of the sides of the soles. <laughs> My own delight at this place, an entire department store radiating obsessive compulsive desire, <laughs> was immediate and intense. I had stumbled, I felt, upon some core aspect of Japanese culture, and everything I've learned since has only confirmed this. America or England might someday produce a specialist department store combining do-it-yourself home repair with less practical crafts, but it wouldn't be talk you hands. Later, I would discover Koichi Suzuki's photograph of the interiors of Japanese apartments. Cockpit living, he called it. Everything you own directly before you, constantly available to your gaze. The pleasure of a littered coziness in what to Western eyes seem impossibly tiny spaces like living in a Cornell box that's been through a mild earthquake, and likely it has. Deliberately yet, deliberate yet gratuitous collections of things, a bachelor's apartment wall stacked floor to ceiling with unopened plastic model kits of military vehicles. I suspected that these photographs brought me closer to grasping the mystery at the heart of Takyu hands, 
but still it remained just out of cultural reach. As many as one million Japanese, the majority of them young males, have now retreated into their rooms, some for as little as six months, others for as long as ten years. Forty-one percent of them withdraw for from one to five years, yet relatively few of them display symptoms of agoraphobia, depression, or any other condition that would ordinarily be expected to account for such behavior. A Japanese parent will not enter a child's room without permission. Vending machines in Tokyo constitute a secret city of solitude. Limiting oneself to purchases from vending machines, it's possible to spend entire days in Tokyo without having to make eye contact with another sentient being. The paradoxical solitude and omnipotence of the otaku, the new century's ultimate enthusiast, the glory and terror inherent in the absolute narrowing of personal bandwidth. Hikaru Dorodango, shiny balls of mud. Professor Fumio Keo of the Kyoto University of Education first encountered these enigmatic, glistening spheres in a nursery school in Kyoto in 1999. The Dorodango, balls of mud compressed with the hands and painstakingly formed into perfect spheres, became the object of considerable media attention. The silent young men who must sometimes appear blinking in the unaccustomed glare of a Tokyo 7-Eleven at 3 in the morning, stocking up on white foam bowls of instant ramen in their unlaundered, curiously outmoded clothing, are themselves engaged in the creation of Dora Dango, <clears throat> their chosen material, existence itself. About three inches in diameter, the surface of a completed Dorodango glistens with an illusion of depth, not unlike that seen in traditional Japanese pottery glazes. A Dorodango becomes its maker's greatest treasure. Keo has invented a scale for recording a Dorodango's luster with the shiniest rating of five. It took him 200 attempts and analysis with an electron microscope to duplicate the children's results and produce an adequately lustrous Dorodango. The genesis of the making of Hikaru Dorodango remains an absolute mystery. The floors of Taku hands are haunted for me now with the mysterious, all-encompassing presence of the Hikaru Dorodango an artifact of such utter simplicity and perfection that it seems it must, must be either the first object or the last. Something that either, instigate, that either instigated the Big Bang or awaits the final precipitous descent into universal silence. At the very end of things waits the Hikaru Dorodango, a perfect three-inch sphere of mud. At its heart, the unthinkable. The secret of Taku hands is that everything on offer there inclines ultimately to the status, if not the perfection, of Hikaru Dorodango. The brogues shine lovingly enough for long enough with those meticulously imported shoe care products must ultimately become a universe unto themselves, the conceptual sphere of lustrous and infinite depth. Just as a life lived silently enough in sufficient solitude becomes a different sort of sphere, no less perfect. Thank you. Thank you.